we're fortunate to have with us Doug Michigan uh, to talk to us all about the Constitution. Aaron Sorkin, the West Wing, that's our book. Um, Doug Michigan is a lawyer, a singer, songwriter, and a frequent lecturer. At uh, the Osho Lifelong Learning Institute, he has taught on topics ranging from the musical tradition of Woody Guthrie to the legacy of the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. Earlier this year, he interviewed civil rights legend Fred Gray, the lawyer who represented Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Doug's own legal career includes 18 years in Washington, D.C., and since moving back to the Northeast, representing low income clients in housing matters. He has also worked with our own Manhattan Newton, placing Simon Duarte students in internships with social justice organizations throughout the work year. His talk tonight, Afternoon, we follow by QA, and he looks forward to taking your questions and maybe even arguing with you in a back and forth, walking, wall talking kind of Aaron sort of way. So, please join me in welcoming Doug Michigan. question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jenny. I'm a sophomore and this is for all three of you. Can you say in one sentence or less what, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Can you say why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. Lewis? Uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, the New York Jets. <laughs> no, I'm going to hold you to an answer on that. What makes America the greatest country in the world? Well, Lewis and Sharon said it. Diversity and opportunity and freedom and freedom. I'm not letting you go back to the airport without answering the question. Well, our Constitution is a masterpiece. James Madison was a genius. The Declaration of Independence is, for me, the single greatest piece of American writing. You don't look satisfied. One's a set of laws and the other's a declaration of war. I want a human moment from you. What about the people? Why is it not the greatest, the greatest country in the world? Professor, that's my answer. You're saying yes. Let's talk about fine. The Sharon, the NEA is a loser. Yeah, it accounts for a penny out of our paycheck, but he gets to hit you with it anytime he wants. It doesn't cost money. It costs votes. It costs airtime and column inches. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so fucking smart, how come they lose so goddamn always? Hey. And with a straight face, you're going to tell students that America is so star spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom? Canada has freedom. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. So 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. All right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world 
in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? We'll get back to that scene later. <laughs> today, I want to address three questions. First, why are we here today? Next, what does the writer Aaron Sorkin have to do with why we're here? And third, so what? Why do the first two questions matter? Let's start with why we're here. The law establishing this holiday was enacted in 2004. The law requires that all publicly funded educational institutions provide programming on the history of the American Constitution. So I am honored to be used by Simon's Rock as part of its legal compliance program. <laughs> <laughs> on September 17, 1787, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed the document in Philadelphia. The Constitution then had to be adopted in state constitutional conventions. We're sitting in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was the sixth state to ratify the Constitution. The Massachusetts Convention adopted the Constitution by the resounding vote of 187 to 168. I grew up in New York. Maybe some of you are from New York. On July 26, 1788, New York became the 11th state to adopt the federal constitution when its convention approved it by the overwhelming vote of 30 to 27. Now, what about the popular vote in Massachusetts and New York? How did the people themselves actually vote on the constitution? Don't be ridiculous. Taking a vote of the people themselves would have been far too democratic a process for those times. 187 to 168, 30 to 27. What's going on here? When people argue about the Constitution, you hear a lot of them say things like, the founders intended this and the founders intended that. Ask yourself, what did the founders intend regarding nuclear power, or genetic engineering, or social media. Seriously, the founders didn't know what a flashlight is. These state convention delegates and many others split almost right down the middle on whether even to adopt the Constitution. I'll leave it to your history and political science professors to talk about why. But my point for today is right from the start, and for 239 years since then, we've been arguing with, with, with each other about the Constitution, which leads to what I want to talk with you about today, about arguing with each other. The Constitution was the result of an argument. Who was arguing? A bunch of white male property owners and some of their property was other human beings. What were they arguing about? Principally, how to dippy up power between this new federal government and the individual states. And the result was a document that in large part provides mechanisms for arguing with each other. Three branches of government. How a legislature responds to competing interests of the people it represents. How an executive governs those competing interests and how a judiciary resolves all manner of public and private disputes, including whether, in a given case, the Congress or the executive branch has violated the Constitution. Now, when we argue with each other, we have many tools at our disposal, uh, many ways to express ourselves. We vote, uh, we work for or volunteer for organizations that promote the values we care about, Sometimes we give money, and we can create things. I'm thinking of creative artists. Now, take the song, We Shall Overcome. You all know the song, We Shall Overcome. On March 15, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson spoke before the Congress, 
and a television audience of 70 million Americans to urge passage of the Voting Rights Act. President Johnson famously said that night, all of us must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. And when he said that, Dr. Martin Luther King cried. President Johnson said that because by then, thousands of civil rights activists throughout the country had sung the words, we shall overcome, in defiance of the racists who murdered civil rights workers, who murdered blacks going about their daily lives, who fought hard to keep black Americans from exercising their rights as Americans. There's power in a song. But today I want to talk about a different kind of artistic power. The power of stories. Which leads to my second question. What does the writer Aaron Sorkin have to say about why we're here today? Aaron Sorkin is one of our most gifted storytellers. He tells his stories through his plays, his movies, his television shows. Most of you know at least some of his work. I hope you're familiar with The West Wing, the best television show ever about law, politics, and public policy, if not the best television show ever, period. Now, I bet many of you have seen The Social Network, right, based on the founding of Facebook. You might have seen some of The Newsroom, which gave us the scene I showed you a few minutes ago, or Sports Night, or more recently, the movie, The Trial of the Chicago Seven, about the trial of political activists for their demonstrations at the 1968 National Democratic Convention in Chicago. You might also know the movie, A Few Good Men, a terrific courtroom drama about two Marines charged with killing another Marine. And then there are the movies, Molly's Game, Charlie Wilson's War, The American President, and the TV show, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. If you have not seen all of these, I urge you, remember the advice of Mark Twain, don't let schooling interfere with your education. In other words, start watching. Why Aaron Sorkin? I have three reasons. Reason number three, he's really good. Uh, if you don't already agree with me, let me just say that this past spring, I taught a class on Aaron Sorkin, six lectures, 90 minutes each. So if I start now, uh, I can get us out of here by around 1.30 a.m., or maybe I'll just send you the links. Reason number two why Aaron Sorkin. Sorkin addresses some of the great issues of our time. We're going to see a few tidbits of this afternoon. But reason number one why I want to talk with you about Aaron Sorkin today is Aaron Sorkin loves argument. Sorkin loves argument, but not just any kind of argument. He says at an early age he was drawn to what he called the phonetic sound of intelligence. He likes the sound of intelligent argument. He tells us straight up, He's looking for intelligence. Let's go to the West Wing. Uh, White House staffers Sam Seaborn and Ainsley Hayes are discussing in this next scene what makes for a successful president. Sam is arguing that we should want intelligent people as our presidents. Listen to what Sam has to say. I you that the smartest presidents have been the worst. I don't grant your premise, but... John Quincy Adams was so full of himself, he could hardly build a coalition around having eggs for breakfast. How many grand theories of international relations did Wilson come up with that were dead on arrival in Congress? I don't care. Why? Because before I look for anything, I look for a mind at work. Sam says he's looking for a mind at work. Guess what writer you all know heard that phrase on the West Wing and set it to music. Angelica, remind me what we're looking for. She's looking for me. Eliza, I'm looking for a mind at work. work, work. I'm looking for a mind at work. work, work. I'm looking for a mind at work. work, work. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
That's right, Lin-Manuel Miranda is a fan of the West Wing. He heard the phrase there, and that's how it wound up in Hamilton. Intelligent argument. It should make us uncomfortable. Intelligent argument should make us uncomfortable that the person we disagree with might have a point or might understand or know something that we don't. The West Wing is all about people arguing with each other. Here's a scene that demonstrates this point. Now keep in mind, this is from about 20 years ago. Josh Lyman, who works for President Bartlett, is interviewing an African-American lawyer for a position in the Justice Department that requires Senate approval. I just got this handed to me last night, so I'm not as up to speed a as I A couple like. of Republicans on the Judiciary Committee have a problem with me. Stadler. Also probably Wachtell and Tillerson. Probably. Any specific problem, or they just don't like me on spec? No. <laughs> There's a, a book coming out by Otis Hastings called The Unpaid Debt. Hastings' position is that African Americans are owed monetary reparations for slavery. Yes. You're quoted on the back jacket. Yes. You wrote, Otis Hastings is a unique and extraordinary historian. This book should be read by everyone and burned into the minds of white America. Yes. Just to start, you weren't misquoted, right? No. Okay, and I'm assuming if asked by the committee, you'll say that you're in favor of reparations. If asked, I'll tell the committee that my father's fathers were kidnapped outside a village called Wimbabwe, brought to New Guinea, sold to a slave trader from Boston, and bought by a plantation owner in Wadsworth, South Carolina, where they worked for no wages. And you're looking for back pay? Yes. Just out of curiosity, did you have a, a figure in mind? Dr. Harold Washington, who's chief economist at the Manchester Institute, calculated the number of slaves held, multiplied it by the number of hours worked, multiplied that by the market value of manual labor, and came up with a very conservative figure. What is it? $1.7 trillion. OK, listen, this is probably a, a better discussion to have in the abstract, don't you think? No. What do you mean? I mean, someone owes me and my friends $1.7 trillion. Trillion dollars, a lot of money, 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, most people sitting in Josh Lyman's seat thought the idea of reparations for slavery was way out there. 20 years later, Reparations for slavery is an idea that's out there. That conversation made people like Josh Lyman, which means most people, uncomfortable. Good. Here's a scene with a different kind of argument, again from the West Wing, and keeping in mind this was 20 years ago when the issue of gays in the military was, shall we say, a lot more controversial. In this scene, Sam Seaborn is talking with several military officers about the issue. The White House wants to break through on the issue to make progress. The military officers are pushing back. Then, the meeting is joined by Admiral Percy Fitzwallis, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Hang on. I'm saying. Hang on. A lot of those cases. In this report, by the way. The report. No, I'm saying. We, read. we know the report. We know the report. A lot of those cases you're talking about of the gays being discharged came from voluntary statements. And a lot of these are not voluntary statements, not by any definition given by any civilian court in this country. It is not a voluntary statement when it's given to a psychotherapist, as in the case of former Marine Corporal David Blessing. It is not a voluntary statement when it's made in a personal diary as in the case of former West Point cadet Nicole Garrison. It is not when it's made after being asked, as in the case of Master Chief Petty Officer Diane Kelly. And it is not when it is coerced out of a service member through fear, through intimidation, through death threats, and threats of criminal prosecution, as in the case of former Air Force Major Bob Kittis, former Marine Gunnery Sergeant Kevin Keyes, and four sailors aboard the USS Essex. Sam, you take care of your guys, we'll take care of ours. You're not taking care of your guys, Major. Your guys are out looking for jobs. Those weren't our guys. Oh, my God. Attention. Good afternoon, Sam. Mr. Chairman. Congressman. How do you do, Admiral? Good to see you again, kid. We haven't met. Mike Satchel. 
From Oregon. Yes, sir. Percy Fitzwallis. It's an honor to meet you, Admiral. I imagine it would be, yes. Uh, Major Tate, Major Thompson, this is Chairman Fitzwallis. They're not going to speak until I speak to them, Sam. They're pretty well trained. Stand easy, fellas. This is Danish for anybody? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. We're discussing gays in the military, huh? Yes, sir. What do you think? I said, what do you think? Sir, we're here to help the White House form a policy. I know. Team. I'm asking you what you think. Sir, we're not prejudiced toward homosexuals. You just don't want to see them serving in the armed forces. No, sir, I don't. Because they pose a threat to unit discipline and cohesion. Yes, sir. That's what I think, too. I also think the military wasn't designed to be an instrument of social change. Yes, sir. Problem with that is, that's what they were saying about me 50 years ago. Blacks shouldn't serve with whites. It would disrupt the unit. You know what? It did disrupt the unit. The unit got over it. The unit changed. I'm an admiral in the U.S. Navy and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Beat that with a stick. We'll see you, Ken. What a great argument. What makes it great? Fitzwallis starts by asking the two soldiers what they think. Now pay attention, because getting the other side to talk first is frequently a good tactic. Then Fitzwallis argues both sides. He acknowledges the argument of the other side, an argument that was prevalent among the leadership of the military over which he presided. He knew their arguments, he understood them, and then he destroyed them. Beat that with a stick. Fitzwallis and Sorkin are modeling behavior that we should emulate. If you want to argue a position, say the Constitution protects a woman's right to have an abortion, can you argue the other side's position? Until you can argue the other side's position, you're not going to be able to formulate your strongest argument. Until you can argue the other side's position, you're not going to find the potential weaknesses in your argument. And yes, virtually every argument has its strengths and weaknesses. You don't want to learn about the weaknesses in your argument when you're arguing in a courtroom, or in a town meeting, or in a classroom. Until you can argue the other side's position, you're not likely to be able to convince the other side of yours. I want to take us to a different kind of argument. I suspect that most, if not all of you, have read To Kill a Mockingbird at one time or another. It's the mid-1930s in the fictional southern town of Maycomb, a black man, Tom Robinson, is wrongly accused of raping a white woman. He's on trial for his life. And a white lawyer, Atticus Finch, defends Tom Robinson and thus is portrayed as a hero. The novel was published in 1960 and shortly thereafter became a famous movie. In 2018, Aaron Sorkin turned that novel into a Broadway play. Sorkin said that one key piece to Atticus Finch in the novel and the movie was Atticus's idea that there's good in everyone. Sorkin said in 2018, 58 years after the novel, that that sounded a little too much like President Trump saying about the Charlottesville white nationalists that there were good people on both sides of that incident. Sorkin said what he learned about Atticus Finch in writing the play was that the one part of Atticus that we thought was a virtue turns out in another way to have been a flaw. That led Sorkin to give voice to the character Calpurnia, the black maid in Atticus's house. We're going to listen to just a few seconds of Calpurnia and Atticus. Atticus is telling Calpurnia he doesn't want people hating people they disagree with. Listen to Calpurnia's response. I don't want them hating people they disagree with. You got to give make them time, Cal. This is the Deep South. You got to give make them time. <laughs> well, how much time would make them like? 
Sorkin says to him, words are like music. How much time would make them like? Now, in Sorkin's rewrite of To Kill a Mockingbird, he gives Calpurnia a voice that we don't hear in the novel and the movie. To have a fair argument, to have an intelligent argument, to have a moral argument, we need to hear from Calpurnia. How frequently in our past have we shut out voices of oppressed or minority communities because we couldn't hear them or didn't want to hear them? How frequently do we do that now? Intelligent argument makes us stronger, but that only happens if we hear from the Calpurnians. Still, there are those who do not know the difference between intelligent argument and the other stuff. Sorkin knows the difference. And he helps us see the difference. He shines a light on the difference in this brilliant scene from the show The Newsroom, which aired from 2012 to 2014. Uh, the Newsroom is about a fictional news network and its nightly news show anchored by Will McAvoy. You saw Will in the opening scene I showed you. You're going to hear from him again in a few minutes. Uh, for the scene I'm about to show you, you need to know, in the newsroom, the owner of the network, Atlantis Cable News, ACN, has created an app called AC Engage. The app gives information about public sightings of celebrities. Sloan Sabbath is a reporter on ACN, and she and other reporters are outraged by this app. Here, Sloan Sabbath interviews the guy who runs the app. And we're joined now by Bree Dorrit, editor of ACN Digital and father of the AC Engage app. Thanks for joining us, Bree. Hi, Sloan. We saw some of it in the package we just played, but tell us about AC Engage. It's a map that tells you where celebrities have been sighted in New York or Los Angeles and soon will be expanding to Vegas and South Beach. Anytime you want, you can scroll around and see, you know, Jude Law was shopping for condoms at Wayne Reed on 57th. So or people are out there and they can post a message to us and say, Kristen Bell and her kid are at the 4 p.m. showing of How to Train Your Dragon at the Arclight. And it goes right on our map instantly. So that when Kristen Bell and her kid come out of the movies, there are a dozen sociopaths waiting for them. I don't think that's likely. Why not? Well, uh, it's the price of fame, isn't it? No, it's not. It's a punishment for it. Celebrities have been stalked and celebrities have been murdered. What this app is best at is assisting in that, right? I'm sorry you feel that way. AC Engage is citizen journalism. Can you talk about the vetting process the citizen journalism undergoes? The vetting? People can post more than locations. They can post observations. That's right. I'm asking if those posts are fact-checked. This is one specific element of the For site. For instance, in a post today, a citizen journalist tells us that Jimmy Kimmel was visibly intoxicated last night at the Soho House in West Hollywood. That's right. Jimmy Kimmel was with his family in Cabo San Lucas last night. Uh, people don't read this with the expectation of it being true. Everyone, Excuse me? Everyone... People don't have an expectation that what they're reading is true? They read it for the immediacy. But you're using the word journalism. Which means there is an expectation that what they're reading is true. But let me take it a step further. Let's pretend it was true. That Jimmy Kimmel was intoxicated last night at the Soho House in West Hollywood. It's not true, but we don't care, so let's pretend that it is, since that's what we're doing anyway. Why does that belong on our website? Leave her on as long as she wants. Honestly, I think there is a shifting definition of what's public and private space. There is, and we should care about that. But my question is, why should we care about a talk show host drinking at a bar? Don't you think it's great that we're not putting people up on a pedestal and worshiping them anymore? I don't think celebrities are one of the bigger problems facing us, but aren't we the ones building the pedestal? We've got a map that gives us their location. The idea is that we're acknowledging that they're real people. I wonder how many of us didn't already know that, but you're doing more than acknowledging they're real people. You're beating them up for it. Aren't they protected by the piles of money they're surrounded by? Okay, what's the line of demarcation? You make over X dollars a year, and now you get to be treated by us as a regular person who's basically had an electronic bracelet slapped on their ankle. What does X equal? It would be silly to name an exact dollar amount. You're paid $55,000 a year. Well, that's private. <laughs> Sorry. That's almost twice the national average for a family of four. Do your piles of cash protect you from this interview in which I'm intentionally stripping you of your dignity? And by the way, I've managed to do it without lying once. So I'm going to give you another chance to answer my question before I answer it myself. What's the value of an unsourced, unbed story about a grown man drinking at a bar?
I can't give you all the time in the world. It's entertainment. My concern isn't for the celebrities, even though as sure as we're sitting here, someone's gonna get hurt. My concern's for the rest of us, who you're turning into a wild pack of prideless punks. That's News Night for June 24th. I'm Sloan Sabbath, filling in for Will McAvoy. Terry Smith's up next with the Capitol Report. The focus here is on making fun of pseudo-journalism and the fascination with celebrity. But there's a larger point here, and it gets to the heart of what makes argument intelligent. The key moment is where Sloan, I've watched this scene about 40 times, so we're on a first name basis. <laughs> where Sloan says, you're using the word journalism. She then asks this doofus to talk about how his stories are vetted and fact-checked. Of course they're not. What's her point? Calling something journalism implies a set of standards. Journalism means the goal is finding the truth. It means there's a process that involves actual reporting and vetting of sources and checking of facts. Publishing words that are not the result of that process is not journalism, it's gossip. Now, similarly, calling something science implies a set of standards. That people with a certain level of training have subjected a hypothesis to testing that conforms to what we call scientific method with a result that can be replicated, etc., etc. Anything else is not science. People may say they believe things that are not the result of scientific method, but what people believe may be religion, it may be something else, but it's not science. At the end of this scene, my friend Sloan Sabbath nails why we should care about morons like this guy. When she says, my concern is for the rest of us, who you're turning into a wild pack of prideless punks. Sloan is saying to her viewers and to all of us, don't fall for this stuff. Don't be part of that wild pack. Now, why am I showing you these scenes from television shows 20 years old? I'm showing them because I believe they remain current. They're timeless. And part of my support for that argument is when it comes to the West Wing, for example, I think the numbers show the West Wing is as popular today on HBO Max as it was when it was first broadcast on NBC 20 years ago. Millions of people were moved by singing or hearing We Shall Overcome, and many of them became the civil rights movement, or people who voted for candidates who furthered the civil rights movement, or who worked in innumerable ways to promote civil rights. Millions of people have watched the West Wing, and many who sign up for careers in government and other kinds of public service cite the West Wing as their inspiration. Democrats, Republicans, independents, all stripes. I want to begin to finish by showing you two extended sequences. The first one picks up on the scene I showed you at the outset today. It's from the opening episode of The Newsroom 10 years ago. Remember, news anchor Will McAvoy was asked by a college student, why is America the greatest country in the world? You heard him explode. It isn't. I'm going to show you the last minute of that scene again, and then show you the rest of that scene so you can see what Will said to follow up. Just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world 
in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. We waged wars on poverty, not poor people. We sacrificed, we cared about our neighbors. We put our money where our mouths were and we never beat our chest. We built great big things, made ungodly technological advances, explored the universe, cured diseases, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. We reached for the stars, acted like men. We aspired to intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. We didn't identify ourselves by who we voted for in the last election, and we didn't, oh, we didn't scare so easy. We were able to be all these things and do all these things because we were informed by great men, men who were revered. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Enough? America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. That's quite a speech. Does it move you? It moved me the first time I heard it. Then, when I watched it another 20 or 30 times, I had a different perspective on it. McAvoy says, we sure used to be. He's harkening back to a rosier past. It's a rosier past. And it's a mythic past. He says we passed and struck down laws for moral reasons. Except now, states pass legisl legislation mocking the Voting Rights Act, a significant portion of which was struck down by the Supreme Court. He says we cared about our neighbors. Except those neighbors included the names we now read at the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. He says, we put our money where our mouths were, except we put a lot more money into affluent neighborhood public schools than elsewhere. He says, we never beat our chest, except we sent my contemporaries to die in Vietnam while participating in the killing of Vietnamese. He says, we acted like men, as opposed to women. He says, America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Anymore? College students in 2012 were members of the worst generation ever? Really? Worse than those previous generations that tolerated all the things I just said? Now, I've told you that Sorkin is, in my view, a master of intelligent argument. Intelligent argument requires that we hear from all the relevant voices. What's the problem here? We're missing the voice of Calpurnia. Now, when I listen to Will McAvoy, I think of the great writer James Baldwin, who wrote in the 1960s, the American Negro has the great advantage of having never believed that collection of myths to which white Americans claim, that their ancestors were all freedom-loving heroes, that they were born in the greatest country the world has ever seen, or that Americans are invincible in battle and wise in peace. I hope some of you are familiar with Professor Eddie Cloud of Princeton. I think Cloud would respond to McAvoy's speech by reading from the, in the introduction to Cloud's book, Begin Again. He writes, the American idea is indeed in trouble. It should be. We have told ourselves a story that secures our virtue and protects 
protects us from our vices, revealing the lie at the heart of the American idea, however, occasions an opportunity to tell a different and better story. Aaron Sorkin is trying to tell us a different and better story. He goes in the right direction, but in this scene, he falls short. In 2018, Sorkin recognized that Atticus Finch's idea that there's good in everyone was a flaw, not a virtue. I'm betting that if the Aaron Sorkin of 2018 had written this 2012 scene in the newsroom, there would have been at least one more panelist, black, LGBTQ, Latinx, who would have said, you must be kidding. A rosier past? When? When slavery was the law? When Jim Crow was the law? When we interned Japanese American citizens during World War II? When we deported Hispanic American citizens throughout our history? When interracial marriage was banned? When homosexuality was an illness and homosexual conduct a crime? Will McAvoy said we were able to do these things because we were informed. But we need to be informed by hearing from all the relevant voices, including the voices missing from the panel discussion you just saw. McAvoy and Sorkin may have shown us a blind spot here. What about that? We all have blind spots. But having a blind spot is not the same thing as being blind. How do we know that McAvoy and Sorkin are not entirely blind? I argue we know it because we look at the entirety of Sorkin's work, and we know it about McAvoy specifically from what I'm about to show you. You just saw him explode in response to being asked what makes America the greatest country of the world. That was in the first episode of the first season of the newsroom. And in that season, he paid a huge price for what you just heard him say. A huge price in his career and in his personal life. The next scene I'm going to show you comes from the end of the first season. You're going to see Will burst into an interview that his producer is conducting with a candidate for an internship. You'll recognize the candidate. So does Will. Who is the girl who is applying to the internship? She looks so familiar to me. I'll tell you who she looks like. She looks exactly like. Good show. I don't care. Okay. Sorority girl. Don't be scared. You're the girl, right? I'm Jennifer Johnson. Just graduated Northwestern. Stay calm. A year early. You asked me that moronic question, and then my world came apart, and she came here, and I landed in the tabloids, and I got death threats, and my job is constantly in jeopardy, and you ruined my life? Again, just stay calm. Yes, that was me. What the hell are you doing here? I'm applying for an internship. Why? I watched the show, and I read the New York Magazine article, and I know what a greater fool is. And I want to be one. Camelot. She's a kid at the end of Camelot. Ask me again. I'm sorry. Ask me your idiot question again. What makes America the greatest country in the world? You do. Hire her. What is the greater fool? Sorkin has explained elsewhere. The greater fool is actually an economic term. It's a patsy. For the rest of us to profit, we need a greater fool, someone who will buy long and sell short so, so we can make money. The greater fool is someone with the perfect blend of self-delusion and ego to think that he can succeed where others have failed. This whole country was made by greater fools. If 
I were in your shoes, I'd be thinking, why should I think that I can succeed? Because it feels like these days, too many people are simply intolerant of people they disagree with. What can we do about that? I'm going to try to answer that question by showing you one last set of scenes from an episode of The West Wing. When September 11th happened, Aaron Sorkin put together a special episode, out of sequence from the rest of The West Wing, to address questions raised by the September 11th attack. I'm going to show you four short scenes. What you need to know is the White House is in a lockdown because there's a concern that a terrorist has made his way onto the White House staff. Students from a presidential classroom who were touring the White House are now stuck talking to Josh Lyman and other White House staffers. So I guess we should use this time. Um, this is the White House, the home of the president and the executive branch, the most powerful of the three branches of the federal government. Yeah. Actually, Mr. Lyman, isn't it true that the framers made sure that the executive branch was the weakest of the three branches? Because we were breaking off from the royalist model that put absolute power in just one place. I mean, isn't that why they made the legislative branch, or people's branch, the most powerful? What's your name? I'm Billy Fernandez. OK, I'll call you Fred. A little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. I don't know how long we're all going to be here, but you just made my list. Yes, I suppose technically, constitutionally, the legislative branch is the most powerful, but we get a motorcade, so back off. So Josh makes fun of Billy, and Billy smiles. It's a hint of things to come. Uh, for the next tidbit, you need to know that Josh and President Bartlett and others had recently been shot at an event in Roslyn, Virginia. Josh makes reference to that in this next clip. Do you get scared coming to work at the White House? No. I mean, we're bystanders, basically. And we work around a lot of people who routinely put themselves in harm's way, the Secret Service in the military. You know, in the protection detail, they practice a thousand different scenarios for a gun. Who tackles the president, who opens the car, who's covering the perimeter. And there's one guy whose job it is to stand in front of the bullet. Not get the shooter, stand in front of the bullet. I've seen them do it. Do you ever think about quitting? No. Well, my, uh, my mother wants me to. <laughs> my family members have a habit of uh, dying before you're supposed to. So it's just me and my mom now. And you guys know, I guess, that I got accidentally shot a little bit or, or something in Rosslyn. So she'd like to see me in the private sector. But I tell her, my government salary may not be a lot, but I still make more than the guy whose job it is to stand in front of the bullets. So how do I tell him I'll quit? Is it any wonder that people are inspired by this show to do government service? Next. We were talking about Al, am I pronouncing this right? Al Hassan Ibn Al Sabah? Yeah, from the 11th century. Yeah. By the way, the Arabic name for their secret order has survived until today. Can anybody guess what it was, the Arabic name? You know. Assassins. Assassins. That's right. Yeah, we don't call on him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. The lockdown is over. And Josh makes some closing remarks to these students. Well, all right. That's it then. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Do you favor the death penalty? No. But do you think we should kill these people? You don't have the choices in a war that you do in a jury room. But I, I, I wish she didn't have to. I think death is too simple. What would you do instead? I'd put them in a small cell and make them watch home movies of the birthdays and baptisms and weddings of every single person they killed over and over every day for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> and then they'd get punched in the mouth every night at bedtime. 
and by a different person every night. There'd be a long list of volunteers, but it's all right. We'll wait. But listen, I, I don't worry about all this right now. We got you covered. Worry about school. Worry about what you're going to tell your parents when you break curfew. You're going to meet guys. You're going to meet girls. Not so much you, friend. You're going to learn things. Be good to each other. Read the newspapers. Go to the movies. Go to a party. Read a book. In the meantime, remember pluralism. You want to get these people? I mean, you, you really want to reach in and kill them where they live? Keep accepting more than one idea. It makes them absolutely crazy. Go. See you later. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It was fun. Don't steal anything on the way out. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Billy. Listen. Nothing. Just Keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Okay. See ya. Josh, Josh urges the students, keep accepting more than one idea. By definition, argument means there's more than one idea in play. But what does Josh tell Billy? He doesn't tell him, register Democratic or sign up for a campaign or Call me when you want to apply to law school. None of that. Josh gives him an assignment that is a compliment. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep asking the right kind of hard questions that are the oxygen on which liberal democracies depend, that give us the confidence to be the greater fool, the greater fool who insists that the right to vote be available to all citizens who insists that the richest nation in the history of the world cannot, cannot have one out of every seven of its people living below the poverty line with 18% of blacks and 22% of Hispanics living in poverty. The greater fool to have the confidence to argue with each other, that's our right, that's our responsibility. If I were in your shoes, I'd be asking, but what about what happened on January 6th? What happened on January 6th was not an argument. It was, among many other things, a rejection of the idea of arguing with each other. It was a statement by some that the rest of us are not worthy of being argued with, that they would put, simply put an end to arguing. Now, it's not an accident that I am here with you today. It's my privilege to work with my friend Manat Wooten, the Director of Academic Transitions and Career Development, to help place Simons Rock students in internships in the Berkshires. Recently, Simons Rock students uh, have interned for organizations like the Berkshire Immigrant Center, which advocates for the rights of all immigrants and helps them with legal services, legal resources, and education. Another Simons Rock student uh, interned with an organization called Springfield No One Leaves, which is a grassroots organization led by its members that organizes tenants and homeowners to help them avoid eviction throughout Western Massachusetts, including the Berkshires. Another intern for the Southern Berkshire Rural Health Network, which helps promote access for all to health care in the Berkshires. These internships are an opportunity for Simons Rock students to learn while giving. You'll learn what it means to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. You'll learn one more way to be a part of our community. And you'll learn the skills of advocacy. How do these organizations actually promote their missions? That's right, you will learn how to argue. And you'll do it while giving of yourself, your brains, your energy, your compassion. These internships are one way that Simons Rock recognizes it's part of the larger community, the Berkshire community. Without the work of these organizations and organizations like them, for many people, our Constitution 
is just an old piece of parchment. These internships are a way of recognizing Constitution Day is every day. If I were in your shoes, I'd be proud to be a part of a school that recognizes that. There is a tendency to think of the Constitution as a legal document. It is, but it is so much more than that. What does due process of law mean? For example, when it comes to sentencing juvenile offenders, we cannot begin to apply due process unless we understand the neurology of how the juvenile mind develops. What does equal protection of the laws mean? For example, we cannot practice true equal protection unless we understand and acknowledge how we went wrong for so many years treating differences in sexual orientation as matters of illness rather than identity. What can due process and equal protection possibly mean without understanding our history of oppressing large parts of our population? What can they possibly mean without grappling with the many roots of long-standing, pervasive poverty in our country? The values of the Constitution go well beyond the law, and so they require more of all of us than just lawyers can contribute. When Josh Lyman saw Billy Fernandez, I think he saw Josh Lyman. And remember what he told Bill, keep doing what you're doing. When I see Billy Fernandez, I see all of you. Which leads to my third question of the day, so what? Why does any of this matter? One of the credit card companies asks in its television commercials, what's in your wallet? I ask all of you today, what's in your constitution? What are you made of? How will you use your opportunity at Simon's Rock to summon up your intellect, your compassion, your courage to be a greater fool? What will you contribute? Will you be a scientist who disco whose discovery advances our understanding of human behavior or of disease? Will you be an economist whose theories promote greater sharing of our collective wealth? Or will you be an artist, a sculptor, a painter, a musician, a poet, or a television writer, playwright, and screenwriter? Yes, will you be another Aaron Sorkin? who was a music theater major in college. Will you be someone whose works of art enhance our appreciation of our freedoms of speech, religion, and assembly? Will you be a teacher, a mechanic, a firefighter, a police officer, a community organizer, a social worker, a member of the clergy, a small business owner, a large business owner, a government worker, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, or a friend? Will you be a person who finds new ways to spread the blessings of liberty that our Constitution was intended to secure, the blessings that still have not found their way to all of us? In other words, what story will you write that will move others? The Constitutional Convention was, uh, adopted the document in Philadelphia. And actually, 70 people were selected by the various states to attend as delegates. Only 55 of them actually attended. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Patrick Henry, they're just some of those who did not attend. And of the 55 who attended, only 39 actually signed the document. What about us? We don't have the option of not attending or signing. We're here, and we inherit what they bequeath. They were a bunch of white males, religiously homogenous, many of whom owned slaves. The founders' experience of the world was far more restricted than ours, and somehow they created a nation and a system of government that endures warts and all. 239 years later, we're still arguing with each other. But it's not inevitable. Our democracy endures only if we make it so.
and it will endure only if we all commit to write a different and better story. At least once a year, it's worth making that commitment out loud. I want to thank Brendan Matthews for making it possible for me to have the privilege of doing so with you today. And to all of you, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. If anyone is so inclined, I'm happy to take some questions, find out what your favorite episodes are of The West Wing and the other shows, uh, or we can all get back to business. I see a hand. Yeah, I have like two questions. One is about the Constitution. Um, if you could change one thing about the Constitution, what would you change? And what do you think Aaron Sorkin would change? Could you all hear the question? If I could change one thing about the Constitution, what would I change? And what do I think Aaron Sorkin would change? That's a terrific question. Uh, I think what I would change if I could do that. Well, I, the easy one for me, uh, keeping in mind that the Bill of Rights, you know, the first 10 amendments, and then you know, we've got 27 amendments to the Constitution, they all came after the Constitution. But given how it has been, in my view, uh, misinterpreted and misapplied, I'd wipe out the Second Amendment like that. Uh, none of this right to bear arms stuff, certainly not the way it's been applied. If Sorkin could take his shot at it, you know, I can honestly tell you I don't, nothing comes quickly to mind, although he has spoken eloquently about the problem of the Second Amendment and uh, how the right to bear arms is, uh, you know, in his view, bastardized. Yes? Uh, I have two questions, too. I have a question about the literature immigration internship and how we get more information on that. And then also, what advice would you have for students that want to go to law in the future? Uh -huh. So on the um, question about uh, finding out about the Berkshire Immigrant Center, which is a wonderful organization, how do you get more information about being able to intern there? Talk to me and Matt, and we will tell you what you need to know. All right? Now, about uh, students who are interested in the law, uh, let me tell you a quick story. When I was in college, there was a political science professor who taught courses about the law, and he was adamant, uh, don't do this, don't take my courses because you want to go to law school, and on the opening day of a course called Courts, Judges, and Politics, 150 students sitting in the lecture hall, he said, I want you all to know that at this moment, uh, I, 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 if you are taking this class to go to law school, I want you to know that at this moment there is a seminar on Dostoevsky, and I commend you uh, commend that seminar to you. Then he said, however, anybody who would take a course for the purpose of going to law school doesn't deserve to study Dostoevsky, so you might as well just sit still where you are. Okay? <laughs> so the first thing I say in all seriousness is don't get, if you're thinking about the law, of course that doesn't mean going to law school. I mean, we encourage lots of people to think about the law in all shapes and sizes. I'm quite serious about you know, the comments I made about everybody's got a contribution, and if you're fascinated by what does due process mean when we sentence juvenile offenders, then maybe neuroscience is in your future, because if we don't understand the neuroscience of juvenile development, how can we possibly uh, be intelligent in our sentencing of people? So, so the law is a huge subject, and I don't, I guess my advice is, I don't want any of you to think that being interested in the law necessarily means thinking about going to law school. If, after all of that, you count yourself uh, among those who are thinking about going to law school, my advice is pretty much the same. That doesn't mean do anything other than take the courses that interest you. Take hard courses, take courses that are going to challenge you, 
to develop your critical thinking faculties as best you can. But that's a broad range of courses. And I, if I were, when I advise young people who ask me about their own personal situation and they say, well, I'm thinking about taking this course or that course because I think it would be helpful to get into law school, I say, over my dead body, no way. I don't want you thinking that way. What I want to hear is, here's something that interests me and I want to study, right? There's no magic to getting into law school based on, on what you study. You need to do well and you need to study hard things to ultimately show people you're capable of critical thinking. What else? Yes? Um, uh, this is kind of specific, but uh, in terms of both like the legal perspective and personally, uh, what do you remember about Watergate? From the legal perspective and personally, what do I remember well, about, I, about Watergate? I know a lot about the event itself, but I make the habit of asking anyone who might have conceivably remembered it uh, what they remember of it. Uh, I guess I look old enough to have a personal memory of Watergate. Uh, it's okay, I'll get over it. I'll get over it. The, the answer is yes, of course I, I remember Watergate. I was, you know, Watergate happened. Uh, you know, my freshman, sophomore-ish years in college. And because I was very interested in all things political, of course I was attuned to it. I'm particularly attuned to it because I happen right now to be in the midst of a terrific book by a historian named Rick Perlstein called The Invisible Bridge. Perlstein has written four volumes and basically the history of the conservative movement in America, starting with Barry Goldwater going up through Reagan. And the Invisible Bridge is the transition from Nixon, namely his presidency, resignation due to Watergate, and we moved on from there. So I'm actually reading about Watergate uh, all over again. Uh, I mean, what to say to capture it? I, I suppose it goes under the heading of uh, when I said a moment ago, you know, our democracy endures, but it's not inevitable uh, that uh, you know, people are capable, leaders are capable of doing real things that jeopardize the values that the democracy depends on. Uh, and so the sequence of lying and obstruction of justice uh, that we experience through Watergate is quite stunning and you know i'm a historian by nature i like to look at the long view of things rather than what happened yesterday what's going to happen tomorrow so you know i spend time thinking about uh you know, how strong an argument was it that trump was somehow much 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 different mm -hmm. from what had come before and the answer is yes and no uh that uh, that I think there's a strong argument to be made that he put us in a much more dangerous place than we had uh, been. Uh, and yet, he didn't come from uh, out of nowhere. And there was a history that gave rise to what happened, and what is happening in the Republican Party, what happened to give us Trump. And I think about Watergate in that context. What's stunning about Watergate is there came a point where even his ardent defenders turned on Richard Nixon and said, that's it. Uh, you know, we'll support you, we'll support you, we'll support you some more, but there are values that are greater than your idea that you need to win re-election in order to save America. It's, you can look high and low and search far and near to find voices among Trump supporters that are willing to say that. I don't hear it, and that's scary. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, you talked about the importance of being able to hold two ideas uh, in an argument, uh, but what do you think about the idea that like, the only true tolerance is being intolerant of the intolerant people? So the question is about tolerance. And uh, you know, if, if we accept the premise that the only true tolerance is tolerating those who are intolerant of us, 
uh, congratulations on asking the unanswerable question, right? I mean, what do we do about that? Uh, you know, what do we say to those who are not willing to recognize our existence, recognize our right to speak, recognize our right to live within our own identities, whether it's national origin, religion, race, you know, pick your category. Uh, I don't have an answer for that, except let me take a swing at the pitch, which is you know, uh, I'm not so interested in thinking about categories of people or how they label themselves. I'm more interested in uh, conduct. And so there are all kinds of things that people can say to me, about me, about people in my religious group, in my, uh, you know, my ethnic background. That people can say all kinds of things which are offensive to me, uh, which hurt me, and which in the end I have to recognize, uh, I have to tolerate, even if they're not prepared to tolerate my expression of identity and background. And I say that because speech is speech. Uh, but conduct is something else. And if you ask, is the line between speech and conduct sometimes blurred? The answer is good for you. Uh, because yes, it is blurred. That's what makes these issues really hard. But conceptually, that's what I try to think about. That yes, every one of us needs to be prepared to hear a lot of things said about us and people we care about uh, and to take it. But when it comes to actual conduct, policies that are implemented, ways in which disputes are uh, 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 fought out, uh, conduct is something else. But there's no, you know, there's no bright line answer to that question. Many of us struggle with it a lot. So would you argue with a person who denies your right to speak? Would I argue with someone who denies my right to speak or to exist? Like to speak. Sure. What, and the answer is, uh, sure. I'm sure I've done it. Uh, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't uh, uh, preclude doing that, in part because uh, I have some faith that sometimes when you might least expect it, dialogue leads to progress. Dialogue leads to something constructive. And it doesn't necessarily happen within the time that you're engaged with someone, right? So I am... I have enough hubris to think that maybe on occasion I can say or do something that upon reflection the other person will treat with respect and maybe even get them to understand something that they didn't understand before and that that leads to some kind of change. I may be kidding myself, uh, but the alternative is pretty harsh, uh, namely to say it's not worth attempting to engage in mm -hmm. constructive dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, my second question was, who do you think is giving an intelligent, intelligent argument today in real life for the government, and if you're feeling a little spicy, who do you think is not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there are plenty of people in, uh, in government. Yeah, well, uh, yeah let, I'm going to uh, I'm going to exercise the privilege of standing up here and broaden your question a little bit. Because I, I'm not so interested in, oh, this senator engages in the intelligent <coughs> argument and this one doesn't. I mean, I have my favorite senators. I'm sure some of you uh, have yours as well. And there are plenty of them who you know, I uh, have no, um, you know, no respect for. But, but I'm more interested in the broader dialogue. So for example, uh, well, let's take two people. Well, let's take Professor Eddie Glau, because he's still with us and he's, you know, he's he's active. Uh, Eddie Glau, whom I know just a little bit through reading some of his stuff, and then you get to see him on uh, MSNBC and other places. And incredibly, I belong to a synagogue in Washington D.C. that invited him in to be a guest speaker on some holiday occasion a year or two ago. It was magnificent to have him all to ourselves. That kind of public intellectual is somebody who offers all of us you know, great gifts. Um, you know, this is a serious person. 
And I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but I certainly agree with what he's trying to do, right? To, to say, you know, when he says, you know, the American idea is in trouble, it should be. A lot of this is based on a lie. Some of us need to hear that message. And, and, and this business of telling a better and different story, we need to internalize that. So I'm grateful to a thinker and a writer like Professor Glad who frames that in a way that I can understand and, and in a way that helps me think through what does this mean for me? Um, you know, I, 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 let's leave it at that. I, I think the examples of those who don't qualify as being you know, engaged in an intelligent argument, they're pretty self-evident. Uh, um, but I'll, if I can leave you with one name, I think Professor Eddie Glaub, Begin Again, uh, is an extraordinary book. Yes? So, in terms of, like, uh, actively arguing and, like, being aware of, like, both parts of an argument, what are, like, a couple of things you might recommend to, like, start doing so? Another terrific question. When I talk about knowing both sides of an argument, what do I recommend uh, to be able to start to do that? Uh, I'm really glad that you picked up on that because when I was thinking about putting this talk together and I realized I just spent the last year of my life, uh, hundreds of hours, putting together the Aaron Sorkin course. And I thought, Aaron Sorkin, the Constitution, Sorkin loves argument. There's got to be something in there. But it made me think back to something that a professor in law school said. And there weren't that many memorable quotes coming from my law school professors, but one of them was, if you can't argue both sides of the case, then you're not prepared. So how do you begin to do that? And I think the best way to do that is to do it with someone else. In my law practice, uh, I hate working on things by myself. Uh, and almost always, I get to work on my cases with at least one other person. And what that means is when I'm writing a brief, somebody else is looking at that brief on the screen, and we say, okay, sentence, the first sentence, do you, I just wrote that. What does that mean to you? Is it right? Can we say it better? Is there another way to say it? What's the other side going to say? I find it helpful to do it in dialogue with another person. Get somebody who can argue with you even if the other person agrees with you. I don't care about that. You need to play the role of you take that side, you take the other side. And I'll frequently say to uh, lawyers I work with, you know, what's the other side going to say? Put yourself in their shoes and make that argument. Mm -hmm. I think the key to it is having somebody to argue with. Mm -hmm. It's a good, excellent question. Nuts and bolts. How do you do it? Anybody else? Okay, well, I have about 12 hours more of Sorkin video. <laughs> Thank you very much for this. It's a pleasure.